Everything about your way of life could be about to change dramatically. How you store your money, where you plan to retire, the way you protect your family and home. All of these things, we believe, are under threat. We don't make this prediction lightly. We're simply following our research to its logical conclusion. We did the same when we anticipated the global credit crisis, the property slide, and the collapse of the banks. In fact, in the 12 years we've been publishing Money Week magazine, this is the most serious warning we've ever made. As you'll see in this short film, we have uncovered an unsolvable problem at the heart of our financial system. We believe the outcome of this problem is inevitable, and the recession, joblessness and instability you see right now is only the first stage of it. Many people think the slump we're in now is as bad as it will get, but the truth is, it's only the start. In fact, you'll certainly see the consequences of this deep-rooted problem unfold across the cities, towns and villages of Britain. No one will escape the fallout. In all recorded history, no country has ever recovered from the financial position we find ourselves in today. No government has ever been able to reverse this trend. No emergency action has ever come close to a solution. This inescapable problem has only ever had one outcome, financial collapse. You can challenge every single one of our facts in this film and we're confident you'll find that we're right about each allegation we make. Then you can decide for yourself. Will you act now and take this chance to protect yourself and your family from the catastrophe that's brewing in our financial system? We hope so, because if we're right, you'll need to act very quickly. In fact, the downward slide has already begun. Britain is about to be flattened by a tidal wave of debt. It doesn't matter if you vote Conservative, Liberal, Labour, UKIP, or for no party at all. The facts are the facts. Let's take a look at some numbers. Two and a half years ago, when the coalition government formed, we were already in a huge amount of debt. In fact, the previous government had left the country sinking under £700 billion worth. The coalition has spent the last two and a half years desperately and very publicly trying to get our finances in order. We've had an austerity budget. We've had tax hikes. We've had the cuts. But for all that, our national debt is still growing at an incredible rate. Despite David Cameron's talk of austerity, he's going to add an estimated £700 billion to the national debt in just five years. That's more than Tony Blair and Gordon Brown added to the national debt in 11 years. It's more than every British government of the past 100 years put together. The fact is, when you look at our finances as a whole, the coalition isn't cutting anything. State spending is going up, our national debt is going up, and our interest payments are going up. By the next general election in 2015, our national debt is estimated to stand at almost £1.4 trillion. It's clear, our public finances are in an enormous mess. Anyone can see that. And to some extent, some politicians will admit it. But add in our financial, personal and private debts, and an even darker picture emerges. Compared to the size of our economy, Britain is now one of the most heavily indebted countries in the Western world. That's official. Our total debts stand at more than five times what our entire economy is worth. Proportionately, that's more debt than Italy, Portugal, Spain, and almost twice as much debt as Greece. Those are four countries already in the throes of financial crisis. We're the odd one out because we haven't collapsed. Yet. But things can't stay that way for long. You see, the only countries that have more debt than us are Japan, where the economy has stagnated for 20 years and the stock market has crashed by 75% and Ireland, where the housing market has crashed 50% and the government has been forced to accept a bailout. In fact, our debts tower above almost every other nation's. Here are the figures that prove it. That's absolutely incredible, isn't it? Yet you've probably never seen this fact reported in the Telegraph or on Sky News. And the worst part is, 
even that isn't the full story. Because when you add in all of Britain's unfunded obligations, promises the government has made on things like public sector pensions, our debts swell to 900% of our economy. That's right. When you add everything up, we owe nine times what our entire economy is worth. Our political leaders still like to see Britain as a world power. But let's not delude ourselves. It's clear to see we're totally broke. It doesn't matter which set of figures you use or which way you look at Britain's debts. We're merely talking about different shades of disaster here. A country can either pay back its debts or it can't. And it's very clear to us that Britain can't. But how did we get here? After all, we were once the richest and most powerful nation on earth. What happened to all of our money? On the 1st of January 1909, something happened for the first time in British history. The government agreed to redistribute taxes to support people in their old age. On that day, more than any other, the modern welfare state began in earnest. The rules were simple. Men aged 70 and above could claim between two and five shillings per week from the government. But for all the positive press and good feeling, the government wasn't really making that big a financial commitment, because back then the average working man could only expect to live to 48 years of age. That's the equivalent of offering someone a pension today, but only when they reach the ripe old age of 115. So the idea of rewarding anyone who made it to 70 with a handout from the public purse seemed perfectly fair, and more importantly for the government, cheap. It was a perfectly workable policy, but few politicians realised that they were setting in motion a sequence of events that would inevitably lead to the crisis Britain faces now. And let's not forget, at the beginning of the 20th century, Britain still had a booming overseas empire. It had yet to fight in the cripplingly expensive First World War. The economy was on a seemingly permanent upward trajectory. And the idea that Britain could face any kind of decline, financial or otherwise, had not yet entered mainstream thinking. We could afford to pay for a welfare state, so why shouldn't we implement it? But there was one problem. Now the welfare state had started, no one had any idea where it would stop or whether it could actually be stopped if it became unaffordable. We'd created a trap for ourselves, then stepped right into it. It wasn't until the Second World War was finally over that the welfare state really began to grow. Welfare was seen as a major part of winning the peace, keeping the forces of socialism and fascism at bay. Of course, politicians soon realised welfare wasn't just a tool to win the peace. It was also incredibly effective at winning votes, too. This same scenario came to be repeated across the world, in the USA, Japan and across Europe. Seemingly limitless economic growth and prosperity allowed politicians to make an essentially unlimited promise. The government promised to look after you from cradle to grave. This single powerful idea gave government the license to swell to a size unimaginable just half a century earlier. The promises got bigger, and so did the cost. In just a few short years, the size of the welfare state grew almost uncontrollably in a flurry of new laws. There was the Butler Act, which reformed schooling, the Family Allowance Act, the National Insurance Act, the National Health Act, the list went on. The problem was, this all came with a nasty side effect. It was immensely expensive. Everyone assumed we'd be able to pay for it forever, but they were wrong. Politicians found themselves totally and utterly caught in this trap. Any attempt to reduce the size of the welfare state was met with often violent resistance in the form of strikes and protests. Or the party trying to cut back, to do the sensible thing, was simply voted out of power. After all, an ever-growing proportion of the population now benefited from the welfare state in one way or another. The safety net couldn't just be pulled away. The government would forever be saddled with an expense that could only grow. And grow it did. Since public pensions were first introduced, average life expectancy has grown from 48 to 80, a 67% increase. 
but the age at which we retire has remained essentially the same. This has resulted in an estimated £5 trillion worth of pension promises the state has made to its citizens, roughly five times what our entire economy is worth. No one has any idea how we'll pay these. The recent attempts by the government to change the retirement age don't go anywhere near solving the problem. As people have lived longer, the strain on the NHS, the demand for medication, more doctors, nurses and other staff, as well as a skyrocketing cost of caring for the elderly, has pushed our finances to breaking point. In fact, as state spending has grown, so has the cost of running the welfare system itself. For instance, the state employs half a million civil servants. To put that into perspective, during the height of the British Empire, when Britain ran a quarter of the planet, the state employed just 4,000 civil servants. If you're in any doubt just how out of control state spending has become, simply take a look at this. As you can see, spending has exploded in a way no one could have imagined a hundred years ago. With the idea of welfare being such a vote winner, no government could take the bull by the horns and cut it back, not in any meaningful way. They could fiddle round the edges and save a few pennies here and there, but as population grew larger and lived longer, all they could really do was sit back and let a future generation sort it out. And now, it's come down to us. In 2012, for example, the government spent roughly £120 billion more than it collects in taxes. In a situation like this, when you spend more than you earn, there's only one way of paying for it, by borrowing money. That alone is bad enough, but remember, we also have to service our debts, to pay interest on a pile of debt that's mounting ever higher, debt that we'll never pay back. So a vicious cycle was set in motion. Politicians realised that to remain in office, they needed to make bigger promises, call for bigger reforms and ultimately borrow more and more money. This addiction to debt has spread into every corner of British society. Banks, businesses, the ordinary man on the street. These days they all carry a great weight of debt. Debt has become normal. Want a holiday? Pay for it on credit. Want a new crowd-pleasing cut in taxes, funded with debt? To put it bluntly, our politicians, so-called educated people who were meant to be looking after our interests, acted like teenagers with their first credit card, all to win votes. If the UK had been a business or an individual, we'd have been declared bankrupt by now. We'd have been forced to sell our business premises or our home and would have been housed in a run-down flat long ago. We are broke. We have been for a long time. But very soon, it will really hit home. So what's different about today? Why can't the government just keep giving us more and take on more debt to pay for it? That's worked for a hundred years. Why won't it work now? The answer to that is simple. The explosion of government spending and government debt has mostly come in the past 30 years, and during that time it's been easy and cheap for the government to borrow money. You see, interest rates on the government's debt have been steadily falling for 30 years. Here, let us show you. In 1982, Margaret Thatcher's government had to pay 15% to borrow money for three years. This came in the form of a bond, a gilt. Anyone with money, be it a rich country or a pension fund, could invest in the bonds and receive 15% interest in return. But over time, the government's borrowing costs have fallen dramatically. Now, the government only has to pay 2% to borrow money over the same period. That's seven times cheaper than in 1982. And low interest rates make it easier to borrow money. Debt has been getting steadily cheaper for three decades. That has allowed the government to borrow more and more money without having to face the consequences. But these good times are about to come to an end. The simple truth is, if interest rates were at their normal rate of 5%, instead of around the extremely low 2% they're at right now, there's absolutely no way Britain could ever repay its debts. In fact, at normal rates of interest, we're already bust. 
not just in over our heads, but six feet under. It's simple maths. If interest rates moved back towards the normal 5% level, our cost of borrowing would triple. Just to put that into context, if our current debt repayments tripled, the government would have to take drastic action, like abolishing the state pension, or privatising the NHS, or pushing tax rates back up to 90% as they were in the 1960s. In short, Britain would change radically. And that's just if interest rates move back to normal levels. The fact is, when you're in a lot of debt, interest rates are either your lifeline or your death sentence. So long as rates stay low, you can just about keep things on track. You can service your debts, keep borrowing and keep the wolves from your door. When rates move higher, you get squeezed and eventually you're finished. All of a sudden, you have to find more and more money to cover the interest on your debt. This is an extreme example of what happens when interest rates take off. As you can see, in 2009, the Greek government could borrow money at just 1%. Then, in the wake of the financial crisis, the Greek economy hit the rocks, fell into recession, and the markets realised what a complete mess the country was in. Interest rates shot up vertically, and Greece imploded, not just financially, but socially and politically too. As you've seen on the news, there have been riots, suicides, overnight poverty, snap elections and crushing general strikes. People couldn't get their money out of banks fast enough. Businesses collapsed. In that environment, just keeping your family safe is a big challenge. That's the danger of rocketing interest rates to a country with huge debts. As Douglas Carswell MP said recently, Greece might be the first Western country to discover that you cannot keep running up debts to pay for a lifestyle you did not earn. She will not be the last. The laws of mathematics are universal. In Britain, interest rates on government borrowing now stand at record lows. If we're not at rock bottom, then we're incredibly close. That means the most important trend of the next 20 years is almost certainly rising interest rates. Debt has been getting cheaper for 30 years. Now it's about to start getting much more expensive. We're now facing an unprecedented crisis. As interest rates rise, our record debts will become impossible to bear. No one can say how quickly things will escalate. Interest rates could rise overnight, or they could slowly and inevitably push higher, taking years to slowly strangle the economy, the housing market, the stock market, stripping us all of our wealth one day at a time. What we can say with certainty is that sooner or later, interest rates will rise. We're approaching the day when foreign investors realise the scale of our problems and demand higher interest rates or stop lending to us altogether. When that day arrives, we are certain things will get nasty. So what happens to Britain when interest rates rise? What shape will the crisis take? And what does all this mean for you and your family? The first flashpoint will be the banking system. We've already seen this across Europe. This is because banks hold huge amounts of government debt. When interest rates rise, the value of government debt, bonds, falls. Even a small jump in interest rates would wipe billions of capital off banks' balance sheets. It's impossible to say exactly which high street banks, if any, could withstand that kind of hit. As news of the bank's problems hits the press and rumours of a new round of bailouts spread, the public will catch on to what's happening. We're likely to see a run on the banks. Picture the scenes we saw at Northern Rock, as people rushed to get their savings back, but ten times worse. That's because this time round, the government simply won't have the money to bail the banks out again. But the crisis will not be confined to the financial sector. The next domino to fall will be the housing market. Most mortgages are linked to interest rates. As interest rates shoot upwards, millions of people will be pushed underwater by a combination of falling housing values and rising mortgage payments. But that isn't all. When a financial system ceases to function, the social fabric begins to fray. 
We're not simply talking about shares falling or house prices dropping, which is devastating enough. We're talking about the breakdown of social order. The important thing to realise is that Britain is going to change very significantly. Things might never be the same again. Is all this too alarming? Some of our critics would say so. Most people think Britain's debt collapse can't happen. Of course, it's hard to picture. Banks look safe until they announce they're broke. Governments say everything's under control until they beg for bailouts. These events often come as a shock to the public. Many people assume they'll never happen. But assumptions can be misleading, especially ones that are widely held. The Victorians thought the British Empire would last forever. Americans in the 20s thought the stock market boom would never end. And here in the UK, during the 90s and early 2000s, we thought we could keep borrowing and spending forever. But if you need any convincing of how quickly things can change, of how rapidly order can turn into chaos, history offers us a number of painful reminders. Let's take just one of them. In the early 20th century, Argentina was one of the world's largest economies. Rich in natural resources, a massive industrial sector, so cultured they called Buenos Aires the Paris of South America. In fact, a popular saying a hundred years ago was as rich as an Argentine. But fast forward to the end of the 20th century and things looked very different. Argentina's borrowing spiralled out of control. As Argentina's debt accumulated in the late 90s, its financial system buckled. Austerity measures were put in place. Sound familiar? Businesses closed, trade fell off a cliff, and investment fled the country by the billion. Come early 2001, the country was in a state of siege, with banks blocking cash withdrawals, rioting in the streets, and the total collapse of government. So desperate were villagers for food, they hijacked livestock trucks and slaughtered the animals in the streets. To give you some idea of how bad things got and how quickly they escalated, you need to listen to our man in Argentina, Federico Tesore. Federico is one of our private network of analysts. He worked as a financial advisor for Citibank in Buenos Aires at the time, experiencing the chaos firsthand. He's got quite a story to tell. It was 2001. The US had just suffered the 9-11 attacks. Many Argentines were frightened about what could happen in America. It was chaos. So they decided to bring back their money to Argentina. But that was a terrible mistake, because in December of 2001, the Argentinian government created the Corralito. In English, you will say play pain, I think. We call it a money prison. This meant that you could only get out 500 US dollars per week in cash from your bank account. It didn't matter if you had 1 million in the bank. In cash, you could only get 500 dollars per week. For two months, this madness continued until the government decided to convert the US dollar deposit into Argentinian pesos. The official exchange rate was 1.4 to 1, but the illegal market exchange rate was 3 to 1. Even worse, this conversion was not in cash. The government created a 10-year bond for depositors. So people that had $100,000 deposited in the bank were given an Argentinian peso 140,000 10 years bond. This, of course, enraged people who stormed into the banks very angry. I was working at the Citibank Bank at the time. I saw what was happening from the inside. More than once, my life was threatened by desperate customers who just wanted to get their money back. I had to talk with thousands of people per day, many old people, and try to explain what was happening. It was almost impossible. One of the hardest parts was to explain why the international bank like Citibank decided not to recognize the dollar deposit to their customer. They had the money brought to do that, but they didn't do it. They basically defrauded their own customer. The depositor attacked the bank, rioting outside, smashing the windows. All the walls were painted with insults and complaints. We had to enter the bank escorted by the police. It was like living in hell. It's a chilling story. Within three or four years, the country fell into financial and social anarchy. And what happened next? 
Well, Argentina wasn't crossed off the map, it still exists, but 12 years on, it's barely recovered. Conditions for many honest, hard-working people are simply terrible. They're still trying to understand what happened to their tattered country. The government has raided public pensions, the stock market is depressed, and the global market steers well clear of Argentine bonds. It's not complicated. Once your country has imploded and trust in systems and institutions has evaporated, investment stays away for decades. Regular Argentines now hoard gold. Endless government scams and corruption have made them suspicious and distrustful. And a culture of short-termism pervades. But that's Argentina, right? A crazy South American country full of impulsive hotheads and corrupt politicians. That could never happen here in Britain. That could never happen to us. Really? Anyone around 50 years old will know that we've had our own taste of financial and social collapse in the relatively near past. Around 40 years ago, Britain entered its own lost decade of economic chaos. Back in the 1970s, inflation ate into cash savings at a rate of 28%. Yes, 28%. It seemed like every time you turned your back, bank savings lost more of their value. Every single day, you became a little poorer. The FTSE 30 entered the worst bear market in history, falling 73% between 1973 and 1974. Even gilts, our so-called safe haven, collapsed as interest rates went sky-high. Rising interest rates buckled the financial system. But it went deeper than that. The speed of social breakdown was frightening. The general strike meant dead bodies went unburied as gravediggers joined the picket line. Stinking piles of rubbish rotted on the streets, towering inside Leicester Square. Those lucky enough to have jobs had to swallow huge wage cuts during the infamous three-day week. Shoppers scoured supermarket shelves by torchlight during blackouts. That's not to mention the violent civil unrest where thousands of the unemployed and strikers clashed with the police. For millions of people trying to keep their hard-earned money secure, it was a nightmare. As the top rate of income tax peaked at 83% in 1974, foreign investment steered away from Britain as if it were an island colony of lepers. We were the sick man of Europe. Property and banking crises meant that people's lives changed dramatically for the worse. Jobs were lost. Family businesses closed. People had to dig deep into their savings just to make ends meet. The country was brought to its knees. So when we're talking about financial emergencies, don't be under any illusions. It can happen here in Britain, just as it can happen anywhere, given the right conditions. In 1976, humiliated, the UK government had to be rescued by the International Monetary Fund, with Jim Callaghan going cap in hand to beg for a huge bailout. Humbled, he delivered what was meant to be a wake-up call for the British financial and political system. We used to think you could spend your way out of recession and increase employment by boosting government spending. I tell you, that option no longer exists. And so far as it ever did exist, it only worked on each occasion by injecting a bigger dose of inflation into the economy, followed by a higher level of unemployment as the next step. These words are amongst the most important ever uttered in the history of modern British politics. Unfortunately, almost everyone has forgotten them. For a left-wing Prime Minister to admit that too much state spending is dangerous should have marked a big turning point in our history. But of course it didn't, as this chart so aptly illustrates. In the 1970s, the spend-borrow-spend spend experiment should have ended. It should have been our wake-up call, but we just kept on spending. So long as interest rates kept going down, there was always a way to put off the pain, a reason to borrow more, a justification for not balancing the books. But the day of reckoning is approaching. When? Well, we can't say exactly. It might be a long, slow, drawn-out process that drains your wealth over the next decade. Or this time next year, the financial system could be breaking apart. It's impossible to say. But we think that savers and investors who are not aware of the full risks 
and who fail to protect themselves will suffer the most. The vast majority of people here in Britain will have no idea what action to take as they watch their wealth and financial security drain away, out of reach, perhaps forever. The important question for you is, when this happens, will you know what to do? When these events unfold, very few people will have any idea how to respond. Most will see the assets they've worked all their life to secure begin to lose value rapidly. It won't matter if you have £5,000 in the bank or £500,000. It won't matter if you own a five-bedroom house in Isha or a one-bedroom flat in Croydon. This crisis will lay waste to the wealth of anyone who isn't prepared for it. The most horrible feeling will be the loss of control and the confusion. Desperate to take some sort of action, many people will feel pressured into making investments that could blow up in their faces. The cost of making the wrong move with your money over the next few years could be lasting. What if your money is trapped in one of the banks that collapse? What if your invested wealth is stuck in one of the companies most likely to crash? This is about knowing what you can do with your money if the worst of the crisis unfolds. Our intention is not to be melodramatic. But if events unravel as we expect, thousands of people will lose a lot of what they have and they won't be able to do a thing about it. By the time most people have pieced it all together, or the true significance of this information makes the headline news in the financial press, it will be too late. And that's why so many people could get caught out and lose so much money. It's essential you prepare for these events. You can't rely on mainstream commentators to help you. Britain's huge accumulation of debt means its fate has already been sealed. We are about to pay for what we've borrowed, and in the worst possible way. If you have any remaining doubts that a day of financial reckoning approaches, watch the next two minutes of this film and we'll prove it to you conclusively. In recorded economic history, every single country with debts as big as ours, every single one, has suffered a devastating economic collapse. There are no exceptions. For example, during the Great Depression, when thousands of ordinary people lost everything, America's total debt hit 252% of GDP. In any circumstances, that's bad. But things can get worse. During the Japanese economic collapse, which triggered more than two decades of deflation and a 75% drop in the stock market, Japanese total debt hit 498% of GDP. That's twice as bad as the level of debt seen in America during the Great Depression. If Britain's current debts were at those kind of levels, it would be worrying. But in truth, our debts are now much worse than either of those two examples. Shockingly, our debt load is now on a scale comparable with one of the most frightening economic disasters of the 20th century. We're talking about the Weimar Republic. Back then, suffering under the weight of brutal war reparations, civil unrest, and shattered public finances, the Weimar Republic's total debt equaled 913% of its economy. Of course, you know what happened next. The government printed money and hyperinflation took off. In the end, it was cheaper to decorate your home with banknotes than wallpaper. Ultimately, the country descended into a period of economic and social crisis, a catastrophe that ended with the rise of the Nazi Party. And that was with debts worth 913% of the economy. Today, Britain's total debt equals 900% of the economy. When you add up our financial sector debt, government debt, personal debt and corporate debts, our debt load rivals the Weimar Republic in scale. To put it mildly, this worries us a great deal. It should worry you too, because this simple fact alone proves just how inevitable Britain's coming crisis is. Remember, as you saw earlier, the only thing delaying the crisis right now is the fact that interest rates are at historical lows. That's what allows life to carry on as normal. But things won't be this way for long, because the simple fact is, when interest rates rise, and they will rise, Britain will face the greatest crisis in generations. And there's one more thing you need to consider. 
the first danger you face won't be the falling price of your shares, nor will it be the insolvency of the banks. Those things we believe will happen, but first you face an even more immediate threat, the desperate actions of our own government. There is nothing the government can do to solve the debt crisis. Better people than David Cameron and George Osborne have tried to get out of similar crises in the past and failed. As you have seen, the hole we've dug for ourselves is simply too big to ever fill back in. But that won't stop politicians making a series of bad decisions to fight the inevitable while they're still in power. They must be seen to be doing something, and that's bad news for you. As the crisis deepens, panic will take hold. In a desperate attempt to pay off the debts and try to regain control, politicians will cast around for any sources of money available and use almost any means to seize it. Invariably, that means they'll turn to their primary source of income, you. Throughout history, when countries are in financial crisis, governments automatically raid the wealth of their citizens. It's all they can do. It goes as far back as ancient Rome. As the empire crumbled and inflation raged, the emperors raised taxes over and over, squeezing as much coin as they could from their subjects. Back to the 20th century, in 1933, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 6102, forbidding the man on the street to hold any significant amount of gold. In the midst of the Great Depression, the government basically made it illegal for anyone but them to hoard the precious yellow metal. Refusal to comply with these demands was met with a five-year prison sentence. That's essentially how the US filled Fort Knox, by seizing other people's gold. Just two years ago in Hungary, facing a debt crisis similar to our own, the government nationalised all pensions. In effect, they confiscated people's savings. Can you imagine waking up one day and being told that the income for the last 30 years of your life hangs on a government promise? In Greece right now, benefits have been cut to the bone, salaries and pensions have been slashed up to 40%, and the retirement age has been hiked to generate more income from the population, the very victims of the crisis. But you don't have to look too far from home to find one of the cruelest examples of seizing private wealth. In 1974, the top rate of income tax under Edward Heath was 83%. Imagine how it would feel to be so blatantly fleeced by your own government. In other words, in times of financial panic, the government will come after the people with money and savings. If you're someone who's worked hard, been responsible, considered the future, thought about your family, planned for your old age and built up savings and some wealth, you are the prime target. The government and financial authorities will never admit this, of course. They will never announce or admit to these confiscation policies. In fact, their official statements are designed to conceal it. And yet, in the end, their actions and the new controls they implement will undermine some of the core principles of the British way of life. The protection of private property, individual freedom, the rule of law, clear limitations on the role of the state, or, to put it colloquially, an Englishman's home is his castle. It's not just your home that will come under threat, it's your money, and the outcome could be very uncomfortable indeed. Just imagine the following situations. You're spending money, limited. You set off to take a brief holiday on the Mediterranean. As you go through security at the airport, you're asked to reveal how much money you have on you. You take out your wallet. Anything over £500 is confiscated, and you can't use your credit cards overseas. Your investment's restricted. You come across an interesting investment idea that involves buying a foreign share. You open up your online stockbroking account and search for it. Instead of the usual ticker code and information, all that appears is an error message. Sorry, but overseas shares are no longer available. A dividend super tax. You decide to review your investments and look through your latest pension and broker statements. To your dismay, you find that the dividend income you expected is much, much lower than usual. You notice a small note at the bottom of the statement. It says, dividend income is now subject to additional dividend control tax at 25%. Your pension downgraded. 
You're watching the 10 o'clock news when the newsreader calmly announces the Chancellor of the Exchequer's latest policy. It's a bombshell. In three months' time, all private pensions will be nationalised, in the national interest, and the government will take control of all pension provision. In Europe right now, in Italy, Spain and Greece, wealth restrictions are already being implemented. These measures have already been discussed amongst Eurozone finance chiefs, limiting the size of withdrawals from cash machines, border checks, the suspensions of free travel between countries. There are draft plans to initiate these extreme measures under desperate circumstances. Considering the UK has one of the largest debt-to-GDP ratios on the planet, how long will it be before your money is seized by our cash-strapped government? Will it be when interest rates creep up 1%? 2%? It's impossible to predict exactly. Unfortunately, you cannot stop the government taking this course of action. Even worse, these measures will primarily be aimed at people exactly like you. People who have worked hard, saved their money and paid their taxes. There may be resistance, even mass protests. But if things get bad enough, we think capital controls will be put in place once again. Remember how Britain got into this dangerous situation in the first place. The enormous cost of welfare started spiralling. We had to borrow hundreds of billions to service it. We had to pay interest on that borrowing. The debt has grown and grown. Soon the rates of interest could rock it. At that point, the government cannot function. And very soon we believe they will target you and your wealth to pay for everything. 